welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. I'm your host, Alex Huma. Delighted to be joined today by Rob Walling, who is the co-founder at MicroConf, uh, the co-founder at Tiny Seed, and the host of uh, uh, Startups for the Rest of Us as well. So, Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great to have you here. We've been following you from a distance, you know, and we're, we're, we're a, a similar path apart from the fact that I've never built a SaaS company. And you mm-hmm. did that, I think, you know, in parallel to uh, many of the things that, that you are doing. And yeah, I came over to MicroConf uh, once in Barcelona. I had some uh, good times there. But it's good to kind of get into it, have you on the podcast and uh, ask some of the questions that I've always wanted to ask. And I think, you know, some from the listeners uh, uh, as well. So delighted to have you. Uh, uh, so, so Rob, we always start, we ask our guests bit of a deep, big question, although we don't have, you know, 30 minutes just on this particular question, but I'm sure we could fill it. But uh, for those that don't know, you know, who is Rob Walling? Yeah. That is a deep question. Do you, do you watch Guardians of the Galaxy? Have you seen the episode? I've seen where, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they say, where is, I forget, where is the character's name? And someone says, uh, and Drax says, no, why? Is character's name right? So I was waiting for you, your deep question to be why is Rob Walling? Why is Rob that would be yeah, that would be even yeah, harder. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Anyways, uh, who is Rob Walling? I mean, you you kind of defined it on the professional side pretty well. It's like I've I've started some SaaS companies, I've had some exits, I've written several books about it, but really these days I focus on MicroConf, which is the original community for SaaS bootstrappers, and Tiny Seed, which is an accelerator for SaaS bootstrappers, and then my podcast, Startups for the Rest of Us, which is the podcast for SaaS bootstrappers. You start to see a pattern here yeah. as we go through it. Uh, on my personal side, I have a family. I have two young, you know, young teenagers, I guess now. One's about to go to college, and um, you know, I've been ma- happily married for, uh, for 23 years, and I play the guitar. Very cool, very cool. Where, where do you reside, Rob? Where's home? Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minneapolis. Born and raised there? No, born in California. I moved here seven years ago when I sold my last startup drip. Okay, so that that was uh, was is it lead pages that acquired Drip? Yeah, the lead pages. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I like to joke that we kind of acquired them because they basically bought Drip, and then Drip became the better. Drip is email marketing tool yeah. or marketing automation, depending on how you look at it. Drip became the better opportunity. The net negative churn, growing faster, you know, better customer base, and so they actually like Drip became the company. Okay. So when I when I sold, we were at 10 employees. I worked there for 20 months. By the time I left, Drip was 110, 120 people and Lead Pages had shrunk its staff and they later sold it to private equity. So Drip lives on these days and Lead Pages is uh, you know, again a, a private it, Was the, the CEO of founder of Lead Pages Clay something Clay Collins. Clay Collins. And did he mm-hmm. did he go like into maybe still is like Bitcoin on crypto. crypto. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's doing Oh, I need to remember what it's called, but, but it's a data a data platform for uh, crypto data. Okay, very cool, very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. And so, seventeen years helping founders and like, independent startups, bootstrap companies. Like, why, why that? Like, you, you know, what, what what's the the kind of the the driver there that, that this is you, your thing and that you've been yeah. doing that for seventeen years. It's a really good question. And the answer is most of it happened by accident until the last five years. And then things started happening deliberately. So in 2005, six, I was blogging about being a developer and being unhappy at companies. And then I had a little bit of a success where I was like, oh, I'm making $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month from a software product. This is pre SaaS. So it was literally downloadable software. You ran on a server. But I was like, oh, I can make my house payment. And it paid like half my salary in essence. And I looked around and there were exactly zero other people in the world that I knew doing this. And so originally, I started kind of trying to teach what I had learned for community. I wanted to find, is there anyone else out there? And sure enough, I was like, oh, Patrick McKenzie. He was doing Bingo Card Creator. He started blogging in 2007 or 08, I think. And then Pell Deagle's own it. Balsamic. He wanted to become a one, he was going to be a one person software company, right? And that was what I was. And so I started finding other people doing it accidentally. You know, and then eventually like kind of accidentally wrote a book because I got a bunch of questions about how I was doing it. And in 2010, published my first book and accidentally started MicroConf where it's like, well, let's all, should we get like 50 of us in a room somewhere in Vegas? You know, a hundred of us. And it, it was just dipping toe in the water. Then the podcast 2011. And that's what I mean where it was like accidental up until I was running, cause SaaS apps 
is how I've made my money. That's how I did, you know, that's how I, I'm a software entrepreneur first. And then this other stuff was just kind of a byproduct of using your own sawdust type thing. And then it wasn't until Soul Drip 2016, I stepped away in 2018 and I said, I might leave all of this for good. And I actually started negotiating to buy the number two tabletop and board game website on the internet because I was like, I'm going to sell my, we got a cash offer for MicroConf at the time. Going to sell it, going to shut the podcast, you know, walk away, yeah. done. And, and I took months to think about this. And then I realized, oh, this is, this is my legacy, actually. This is the thing I've enjoyed doing basically for free, for the most part, yeah. for a decade, you know, or more than that at that, 12 years. And that's when the realization became, I was like, well, maybe I should do it deliberately from now on and actually make decisions instead of like, oh, I'm going to dip my toe in the water. Oh, suddenly I have a podcast that's run for 10 years, 52 episodes a year, you know? And so it started as community. It transitioned into, I became kind of a leader in that community. And then now I view it honestly as my legacy. Like it's probably what I'm going to do for the rest of my career. And it brings me a lot of happiness to do so. Very cool. Well, I, I don't have to ask then, why didn't you uh, take the cash off of a microphone? Because you, uh, you, you've <laughs> that was it. answered that. Yeah. Yeah, and and so when you, you were running MicroConf whilst you were running Drip, Correct. is that right? And but why did yep. you, as you said, I guess you did say like you just wanted to get fifty people in the room. So was that the kind of that was the the origin story of that was the yeah. origin? Yeah, it was that we had a podcast audience of a few thousand, and I had a blog audience like RSS subscriber count of like twenty five thousand. I was like, surely we can get a hundred people in a room. Again, I had never been in a room with like a hundred bootstrap software. I didn't even know what that looked like, right? The the closest thing that I was looking for was business of software, which yeah. I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with, Mark Littlewood. But it was a little different. It was a little further along and like HubSpot was a big, you know, they, they were talking about going public. And I was like, I like their ethos, but like, how about like the one person software companies, right? Or the true like bootstrappers or the people who are only going to raise a hundred or 200 grand knock over venture track. And that was that was the inception of it. And the first year we almost lost our ass. You know, we almost lost 20, 30 grand, which for, it was two of us and we weren't making that much money, you know, from our day job, so to speak. But then each year, the momentum built, it was obvious we put together a decent enough thing that like yeah. word of mouth spread and pretty much, pretty soon we were selling it out in less than a day. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, SaaS stock, we, we lost money, the, the, the first one and mm -hmm. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh shit, like, mm -hmm. where, where's that money going to come from? But I, I basically started selling for the next one and then was able to kind of like recover kind of pretty quickly. And yeah, I think, you know, in terms of the way the commercial model works, be able to you know, yeah. bring in revenue, you know, quite early. I think now like post COVID for, I, I think Microsoft does a little bit of sponsorship, but it's not your main, your main model, right? If, yeah. If that's right. Yeah. Like yeah. For, for us, SaaS stock, 70% of probably revenues coming from partnerships and, like in a pre-COVID world, you could get, mm -hmm. you know, 100% of that partnership revenue 12 months in advance. And now there are a lot of more kind of like protections uh, uh, around that. But things definitely seem to be back yeah. in person, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, very much. Yeah. And in person, a lot of people try in-person events because they look easy when you do it well. And when you go to SaaS stock and people have an amazing time, people think, well, I want to start my own event. Turns out it's really hard and you're likely to lose money for at least the first year or two. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. The things that you don't hear, you know, as much. Although I'm, I'm pretty public about the fact that, you, you know, the first year was really good, but it also I spent too much money. Um, and then tied it, so oh, this, this love, passion uh, for bootstrappers, independent companies. But you have started a fund to back companies. So tell me about that. Uh, you know, is that a, a little bit of a contradiction on, on yeah, it does, right? Because like funding for bootstrappers, doesn't yeah. that make no sense to anybody? Yeah. Here, here, This is where I became deliberate. 2018, I'm running MicroConf and I decide this is, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep helping people, educating people and just being among ambitious bootstrappers for the rest of my life. These are the people I want to be around. So I had the podcast, had MicroConf and I kept hearing, I just need 50 grand, 100 grand, 150 grand to kind of quit the day job or to double down on the business so I can focus and then I think I, you know, I could do better. And the problem was there were no funding sources like that, right? Think back to even like 2015, you kind of raise venture or that's it. And if you do, if, what if you want to build a SaaS business to 5 million a year? There's no funding source, you know, seven years ago for that. But these days, I mean, that's why we started Tiny Seed is I was doing angel investments and I was investing in these, what are pretty low risk, like highly profitable, you know, 80% uh, gross margin, 90% gross margin SaaS companies. But I kind of invested enough of my own personal wealth that I was like, well, 
not going to do anymore. And people started asking like, hey, someone should start a fund to do this. And I remember saying, yeah, someone really should. And then I would kind of walk away. And then later I think, oh, wait, that should probably be me, right? I had never raised funding before that. I bootstrapped everything. Um, but we have raised $42 million across three funds. We invest in you know, the Americas and EMEA. And um, so far invested in about 130 bootstrap companies. And these days I say bootstrapped and mostly bootstrapped. Because honestly, you raise 150 grand, that sounds like a lot. It's nothing. It's not venture. That is so far, you know, until you raise, I mean, you've talked to a venture capitalist who actually invests in the Stripes and the Facebooks and the Googles and anything under a million, it, they basically call bootstrapped. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, like, from a, so you've raised three funds and uh, you raise funds from limited partners um, mm -hmm. and the limited partners are expecting certain returns. And I think in, in traditional venture, they're looking at these certain returns. You, you know, they want some unicorns and decacorns and, and so on and so yeah. forth. So how was that kind of like the sale or the pitch to the LPs to say, hey, look, we're, we're betting on like smaller kind of bootstrap companies mm -hmm. and five million in revenue is okay. Right. That, that, that's sort of quite, quite different from certainly uh, traditional ventures. So how, how did that go in terms of like them recruiting the LPs to say, hey, there'll, yeah. there'll be smaller companies? It's a, it's a really good question. And if folks want to dig into to this deep, tinyc.com slash thesis, where we dive into it. But the short answer is you're absolutely right. Ventures, venture capital needs unicorns or decacorns now because they invest at these massive valuations and they put all this money to work and it has to return the whole fund and one in 10 works and everything else basically breaks even or fails. Our model is far fewer will fail. And we've seen that already in the 130 investments we've made over the past four years, is that the, the number of singles and doubles are coming in quite frequently. You know, a 3x return, a 5x return if someone decides to exit. Our folks also don't have to sell, I will say, right? We, we invest in pass-through entities in the U.S. at least, where they can run it long-term and pull out profits. But the majority of our founders, when I ask them, they say, nope. I want to exit for enough money that I never have to work again, which maybe is for some people 10 million or 20 or whatever. But the reason it works for us, or at least, you know, according to our thesis, and it's kind of playing out this way is we have a lot fewer failures and valuations are different, right? So a venture capitalist can come in and you're doing a few hundred thousand a year and they'll say, cool, $20 million valuation for you. You know, you look at like, uh, after Y Combinator, the, the, the companies that come out of that and they get investments at crazy, what I consider crazy valuations, our valuations are lower than YC and they're lower than angel investments. So we usually invest in the, it's probably about the 1.2 to um, two and a half million, you know, valuation. And we are not the cheapest money, but we run an accelerator with like the world-class SaaS mentors. Go to, you know, tinyc.com slash people and you'll see the the Heaton Shaws and the Jason Freeds and Rand Fishkin and, you know, all the people, Patrick Campbell. And so, so that's where it is, is if we, inv let's say a venture capitalist comes in and invests at 20 million and we invest at a smaller valuation, whether it's two or three. Well, if their company sells for 20 million, they basically get their money back. If our company sells for 20 million, we get seven to 10 times our money back. You know what I mean? So yeah. the, the multiple starts to work there. Yeah. We, we have definitely run the numbers. So my, my co-founder, co-GP, has a PhD in computer science and is a numbers guy. He's in the Excel all the time. And we looked at all different funding models and, and we actually back tested. We got like f five, six, seven years of SaaS data across thousands of companies. And we looked at our model and it was like, ooh, this, this will work at least in, you know, in, what, in the back test and what we're seeing. Very cool, very cool. And then and just kind of finally, just uh, just around selling Drip. So the SaaS company that you sold two lead pages, which is now kind of, as you said, like pretty much Drip. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about that. So like where, where was Drip in terms of size and, you know, revenue? Uh, how long have you been running it? You know, why did you decide to sell then? We obviously know what you did next, right? But uh, tell us a little bit about that, uh, that story. Yeah, so... From the time we broke ground on code until we sold was three and a half years. We grew to a couple million in revenue, a few million. It was low single digits in ARR. We were at 10, 10 people. And really, I, I had a co-founder and we hit a point where we hadn't raised any money. I had self-funded it out of a prior SaaS company that was throwing off cash and we hit a point where we were severely cash constrained in the business and it was hurting our growth and it was burning everyone out. <laughs> and I said, we either need to raise money, half a million bucks, maybe this is 2014, 15. 
where the options were limited. There was no tiny seed. You know, there weren't these, even Indie.vc, if you've heard of them, hadn't launched yet. Yeah. So there wasn't this kind of founder friendly, bootstrap friendly funding. And I didn't, I didn't want to go to a billion and no desire. So I wanted to sell for some, you know, double digit millions. So where I never had to work again, that was kind of became the goal or run it forever. I, I was okay with that. But the bottom line is we started getting a ton of inbound, as you know, that happens from folks wanting to invest and a ton of inbound from people wanting to buy us. And I was fielding both of those and trying to figure out which path we're going to go down. Yeah. And eventually we got a couple pretty serious. We got probably three very serious negotiations that started. And in the end, it was like, okay, so we can take the money and we know we'll keep growing. We were doubling plus every year. So I know it'll be worth more in the future or we can take you know millions off the table in cash. And that was a, that was the calculus we had to, we had to make and decided to, uh, you know, to do it. Very cool. Well, congrats. And then obviously that's enabled you to fulfill, well, what you're doing now, which is, as you say, you, you know, your, uh, uh, your legacy, right. And it's uh, giving back and helping thousands of entrepreneurs. Right. So it's definitely why I love, I mean, what are we doing, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of like community helping entrepreneurs and uh, it's so rewarding and you can learn so much and meet so many cool people like uh, uh, along the way, uh, like ne next week, I get to go, although, I mean, I've created this, right, but we're taking 40 founders out to Mykonos in Greece for like a two-day retreat where they can just step away from the business and a very kind of relaxed agenda where the, you know, just get them meeting each other, one another, and you're a SaaS founder, I'm a SaaS founder, you know, talk to each other and just come away a little bit kind of like, you know, inspired and you know, maybe with a bit more of a suntan uh, uh, as well. But uh, for, for me, as you know, that's what I do. Like, can't beat that, right? I, I, I love that stuff. So uh, it's a good it really kind of gets me going. Um, but yeah, so I saw and I have seen on social that you are writing another book. Is it your third book? Yeah, fourth. Fourth. And it's, uh, I believe the title is going to be, uh, or is how to build a 1 million startup with no VC. There we go. It's called the, the SaaS playbook. Ah, okay. So ultimately, I where I that from. Oh, this is like building a yeah. It, it's the subtitle. It's the yeah, subtitle. Build a there we go. The SaaS yeah, playbook. Yeah. Okay, tell me why you're writing book number four, mm. and also your crowdsourcing uh, to fund it. So, uh, what's mm -hmm. the the idea uh, behind that as well? Yeah, good question. So my first book, Start Small, Stay Small, was about little lifestyle, amazing little lifestyle businesses. Build something to 10k, 20k a month. Quit your job. Changed my life, changes the life of hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. But these days, I'm working with founders that are trying to get to millions or tens of millions, and I haven't ever codified all my thinking around it. Now I have my experience, and I have the experience of literally the tiny 130 tiny seed investments, plus I have almost 20, I have 25 of my own. So 150 SaaS companies I'm invested in, and I know like the day to day. And so I have all these frameworks and thinking around how to grow it, and I haven't, I hadn't written a book about it. And so I actually was being asked. I was being asked questions, whether on Indie Hackers or Reddit or Hacker News, and I started responding to these questions with long form stuff, and I'd throw that in a Google Doc, right? Hey, what's the, should I compete with com competition that's better funded than I am? And I'm like, yes, but here's my framework around how to do that. Here's where I've seen it work. Here's where I see it not. Throw that into a Google Doc. Pretty soon I had 10,000 words, and I started thinking, okay, maybe I'll release an ebook. And then some friends of mine in Tiny Seed said, dude, you haven't written a book in, you know, six years. Last one I co-wrote with my wife, Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. It's about mindset cool. and how to stay sane while doing it. But six, seven years ago. And so I was like, I don't know that I want to spend, this is a time consuming to do it, right? But sat down and did it. And, you know, 45,000 words later, I have the SaaS playbook, which covers like the six main aspects of SaaS. And it's not just about bootstrapping, but it, but it is like, you don't want to become HubSpot or Salesforce. There's an in-between a lifestyle business and HubSpot and Salesforce. And that's where I live, is in this mostly bootstrap world. So that's what the SaaS playbook covers. To talk about crowdfunding, so it's, it was on Kickstarter. It's been funded to the tune. It's, it's done now, $108,000. But you can still go to sasplaybook.com and you can pre-order copies at this point. But the reason I wanted to do that was a little bit, a little bit selfish and then a little bit fun. And the selfish part was I, to, for me to be interested in what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I have to do new things because I need to learn. And I'd never done a crowdfunding campaign. I just wanted to see what it was like. 
I've backed 276 Kickstarters, but I've never run one. And so I wanted to see what it was like to be on the other side of it. The other selfish thing was I view Kickstarter as a community slash social network in a way, more of a community, but I wanted, I, I have reach in Twitter. I've reached on YouTube. I have reached on podcasts, you know, but I've never like ha- been able to reach into the audience of Kickstarter. So I was curious, like, will, will that move the needle for me or not? Yeah. But realistically, the, the, the other reasons for everyone else was like, I wanted to offer a bunch of tiers ranging from 30 bucks for the book up to $5,000 to come hang out with me in person for a few days, you know, this summer. And that is just, you know, seven, eight tiers is so naturally just allowed, right? Kickstarter is native to that. Yeah. And so that made a lot of sense. As well as the need, I wanted to do hardbacks for the first time, and that you have to pre-order months in advance. Blah blah blah. Kickstarter is Kickstarter is also a great pre-order platform. So there was a lot of thought that went into it. I think it was the right. I think it was the right choice, but there was definitely a lot. It was a lot of work. So and, and so you hit your goal. You mentioned, yep. but people yep. can still contribute if they want to, or does it close down now you hit the goal? It so Kickstarter's closed down, yeah. but you can go to sasplaybook.com yeah. and there's a there's basically a Squarespace shopping cart where you can put in the thirty dollars and then you can order, you know, order a copy of the book when it comes out. It'll be out in the next I don't know, eight, six weeks, eight weeks. Okay. We went with a pr- yeah. We were gonna do so we were gonna do a printer in Hong you know in Hong Kong and it's yeah. six month wait time to get it. Twice the price in the US, but it's like six weeks eight weeks and i was like you know what i can make less and get it sooner I, i'm a little impatient that way you can bring some copies to sasok in dublin i think i don't know are i we, should we we 100 percent that you're speaking or we're... we're working on it i really want to speak and i'm it's purely a schedule thing that i'm trying to work out with yeah. my wife so yeah if i show up i will uh i'll have some copies in tow for sure sounds good well, well tell us i'm sure those that are listening will will buy the book and you know hopefully get a signed copy at sasok in dublin this october what can they expect? Like, why, why should somebody that's listening go out and buy the book? What are they going to learn from you? Yeah, it, and that's a good question because there's a lot of books written about startups. And the reason I started writing books was because so many of them suck. And they're by people who've either never done it or who've done it once. And the problem with doing it once is some people do it once and they're amazing and they know what they're doing. A lot of people do it once and kind of get lucky. Right? I think of success as hard work, luck, and skill. It's a combination of those three. Some people get exceptionally lucky and they don't really have the skill to do it. I've done it multiple times. I've started six companies, five of them bootstrapped. All of them, yeah, all of them were successful to, to what they needed to be. And so that's one thing is like, why you should listen to me, right? It's like, I've kind of done it. And also now I have insight into a bunch of companies. I think the other thing is the book is is compact. Like people say... It's 205 pages or something, and it's like very dense, even in in a good well, in a good or a bad way. But it's just like you read 20 each chapter is whatever 20 30 pages. There's only six chapters, and it's like everything I know about building an early stage SaaS team, who you should hire first if you're going to combine roles, how to do it. Like it's all boots on the ground. There's nothing. There's no pontificating and long stories about oh when HubSpot started up. They did the, you know what I mean? Where it's like, did you have a ghostwriter write that to pad pages? Like, that's not what's in the book, right? It's all my thoughts on how to how to find, you know, get to product market fit, how to build a team, how to uh, choose marketing approaches. It's the things that my founders deal with every day as I'm advising them that I wanted a playbook for them. And that's what I'm able to sell to you for 30 bucks, right? So that's, it's as practical as I could, po- and actionable as I could possibly make it. And if, if you're thinking about going on the venture path, is this the book for you or, or, or not? I mean, like some, some uh, obviously don't get on the venture path until they, they bootstrap to yeah, yeah. a degree, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, no, this would be for both, actually. I, the, the subtitle is Without Venture Capital, and it's catering to people who more want to bootstrap. But no, if I was if I was going to bootstrap to a million or two million and then raise venture or half a million and raise venture, this is this absolutely applies to getting to a few million in ARR, you know, single digit million. And so whether you're going to raise or not, I think the playbook's the same. Now, once you have five or ten million dollars in the bank, this playbook is like, nah, you're, you're gonna you're gonna want to go rocket ship, right? And that that playbook is different than what I have here. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely zero to one, one to three, yeah. three to 10, yep. all different stages. Mm-hmm. Uh, sounds good. What about, so we talk about like bootstrapping just a, li- a little bit or, or, or quickly, right? So very, it seems to be more commonplace, I would say these days. So I, I don't really have any data to, you, you know, judge whether that's correct. But certainly at SaaS last year, we, for the first time ever, 
we had a bootstrapping stage because we have quite a bit of a bootstrapping community that's that's building and uh, we're seeing that it's more commonplace. So if you are bootstrapping from zero to one million, within that revenue range, like what are a few things that, that people should be doing to like really help your chances of getting to that one million? Yeah, I think that probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is pricing because it's the biggest lever in SaaS and almost everyone underprices or misprices their their SaaS from day one. So usually it's like raising prices if you, that's an early thing that probably more than half of each tiny seed batch because we run them in you know an accelerator batch, about half the people within the first month raise their prices at my urging because it just is is a big mistake. I think the other thing is you know, the myth of kind of a single, well, what I'll say is if you don't have a technical founder on your founding team, meaning someone who's writing code, it's unfortunate the odds are stacked against you. We see it work, but I mean, it's maybe 10%, 15%, you know, of founders who say make it into tiny seed. And if you think about tiny seed, it's, we've interviewed, we've had thousands and thousands apply, and then we've interviewed a certain amount, and then a certain amount have gotten in. And when you look at who has gotten in, let's say those are the top 2% of all the ones we've seen. Approximation, right? 2%, 3%, whatever the number is. And it's only about 10 or 15% that have a non-technical founder. So it's, we see some succeed, but it, is, it really stacks against you. The other thing I would say is if you're going out for the first time, don't model your goals after the people who have been doing this for 10 years. So I have this thing called the stair-step method of entrepreneurship. And it's start small and then build your way up through multiple products. That's, I think, the biggest takeaway is a lot of people will idolize a Jason Cohen, right, who started WP Engine, a Dharmesh Shah who started HubSpot and say, well, I want to start WP Engine tomorrow. And I've never done, I've never been an entrepreneur, but that's what I'm going to do. It's like, well, well, no, 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 let's go back. Jason Cohen had two successful startups before he did WP Engine. Dharmesh had a successful startup before HubSpot. So start small. Don't try to compete in the major leagues when you haven't even played T-ball. Those are probably some, some thoughts for them. Speaking of Jason Cohen, and I know you probably didn't know this, he is speaking at SaaS like USA in a few weeks' time in Austin. So awesome. first time ever. Again, I'm looking forward to it to seeing him uh, on stage and meeting him in person. I have admired him uh, as well for a, a number of years and uh, he's done some great talks that are on YouTube. Uh, he's great. As well. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. Let's move it into the, uh, the quick fire round uh, now, or quickish fire round now, Rob. What one thing is the most for you in your career? Building my network. Like build, being with, building a network or an audience. They're two very different things. And if you're gifted at an audience and you want an audience, go do that. Don't believe anyone who says, in order to build a successful SaaS, you need an audience because that's not true. <laughs> Your time is better spent learning SEO, learning marketing. But the network, which is the people that I can call up tomorrow and be like, will you endorse my book? Will you recommend me or intro me to this person? You know, my network has. And it, I'm a software developer who hated that it was who you know rather than what you know, right? And so I've only said this after learning, nope, who I know is actually really important. In terms of building your network, have you a tip on that? I, I would imagine this is a very long, you've been doing this for 17 years, right? So you build out a great network from every SaaS company, and Do LC, and Microcom. Yeah. there's no quick hack to building yeah. a network, right? No. No, there's two or three things that I've seen work really well. One is go if you go work at startups that are growing, you're around a bunch of smart people and you're employee number 10 or 15. And when it gets to employee 150, you have a pretty amazing network in that space if you want to go do that. The other thing I've seen is people just systematically go to a lot of in-person events and make friends and talk to influencers and talk to non-influencers. And then the third one is I would, I'll get emails from a founder I've never heard of. They'll ask for advice. I'll give them advice. They come back in two weeks and say, I did your advice. Here's what happened. That's like one in a hundred. So I instantly take notice. And suddenly when they approach me at microconf, I'm like, I remember you, you actually did something. Let me introduce you to this group that you should be part, right? It's like just doing things and actually delivering. There are some, there's some shortcuts, not hacks though. Very cool. Uh, best advice you've ever received? Stop trying to do this alone. Right. Very good. I, I was I was trying to build early software companies like I don't like people. I'm going to do it all on my own. It was dumb. I mean, it ties into what I just said about network, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just on, on that as well. And through the podcast, 
I've been doing the podcast for eight years and, you know, interviewed so many great people and none of them have made it on their own. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. the, the data is compelling there. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm sure like many entrepreneurs, I remember when I started SaaS Doc, I thought, oh, I'll build it on my own. I'll be a one person, and you know, conference team and we'll be have 700 people. And very quickly, I thought, no, it's, it's not the best idea. Yep. Biggest failure you've made, lesson learned? Yeah, I was trying to think about this one. I mean, I've had like monetary failures where I pissed away 10 grand, 20 grand on an experiment. I haven't, luckily I haven't had a catastrophic, like I bet the house and all my credit rating on something because I just, that's not the person I was 10. So I believe like your life should be a series of, of, of ever increasing risks, but never so large that it can wreck you. And so I was, maybe my biggest failure is in my twenties. I should have taken more risk. That's probably it. Is it, I could have gotten here way faster if I hadn't been so timid in the early days. I was so scared of failure. I came from a family. They couldn't backstop me. We were poor. And so that's, that's probably it. Yeah. It's, it's similar ish here. Like in, but it, like in my twenties, I had all these entrepreneurial ideas, but I just never acted on them. Mm. I, I just, I had an idea and I, and I just didn't take it anywhere. And then when I got yep. to 30, I was like, shit, like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. What, what's harder venture capital? Uh, I guess we'll call tiny T venture capital running events or conferences or podcasting. Running events, running way events. harder. Or run and uh, harder than all that is like building a SaaS company oh. to millions. Well, very, very hard. What's the most fun being VC? Pod- Pod- for me, podcast. podcast. I love podcasting. I've been doing it for free, 650 episodes for yeah. 13 years. It's what I would do when if no one was looking. Right? Very cool. Hardest thing about building a startup in 23, 2023? Just how crowded it is. It's so hard to get heard above the noise. And if you don't have some type of unfair advantage, a network, an audience, or being early, those are the three unfair advantages I talk about. It's, you know, it's kind of a grind with a bit of a, a grind with a mix of luck. What does your daily routine look like? Wake up around eight in the morning, get kids on the buses with the help of my wife. And then I record, I, have to, I ship 52 YouTube videos a week that are just me talking to a camera. I ship 104 podcast episodes. I'm sorry, 52 a year, yeah, not a week. Yeah. 50, yeah, 104 podcast episodes a year, some of which are me talking to people, some of which are me talking to a camera. So that is kind of the day-to-day. And then my calendar is filled talking to founders. I advise a lot of founders and uh, we, you know we have playbook meetings and all types of stuff for tiny CD and microconf. Sounds great. Sounds great. Love that. Where can, as we're wrapping up here now, Rob, uh, where can people find you? If they want to kind of reach out and where can they, you know, let's say find the book. I think you did mention that already, but so. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm at Rob Walling on Twitter. And of course, Startups for the Rest of Us is where I do, you know, if you're into podcasts, you're listening to this. I talk about this kind of stuff for 30, 35 minutes every week. And then the sasplaybook.com is where the book's at. Very cool. Well, great stuff. Well, congrats on the book succeeding, you know, with the fundraising uh, on Kickstarter. Uh, Looking forward to reading it uh, and, and getting my own copy. Looking forward to seeing you in Dublin. Hopefully the stars align on that so uh, really appreciate you taking the time you know keep doing the great work yeah great stuff like uh, great to uh, have done this podcast with you today rob great to meet you alex thanks so much for having me on